homemade Valentine's card for uh, for Liz today? Probably just a friendly text <laughs> <laughs> with a couple of emojis. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not terribly commercial about these things. I have been surprised at some aspects uh, and also at uh, the level of influence uh, that one can have has also exceeded my expectations. Episode 71, Chatting Livable Cities and Civics with Wellington Mayor Justin Lester, published Thursday 22nd of February 2018. Twice, talks with innovators, creatives and enterprises, gathers people making positive dents on society and captures and shares some of their stories, learns and journeys to now. I'm your co-host, David Binstead, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge show support from BizDojo and Collider Wellington. Before introducing our guest, I'm pleased to welcome multi-talented guest co-host, Victoria Spackman. How are you doing? I'm doing magnificently, thank you very much. Busy couple of weeks coming up for you. That's right. Uh, yeah, we uh, opened Te Aoha, the New Zealand Institute of Creativity, in a matter of days. And um, so it's a very exciting time. Lots of it, people working very hard to make it amazing. And they are going to because it's, it's, yeah, it's all coming together. And it's going to be incredible. Our early 2018 shows have featured people in the volunteer and philanthropy spaces. One of their common threads is civic engagement to build a thriving and equitable society. So we got thinking, who would be a suitable guest as finale to this sub-series? Someone whose job description could well be summarised as making positive dents on society. Well, he's an advocate, that's an understatement, for the arts and culture. And also not too shabby with numbers, languages and also lawyering. He dotes on his young family and in rare spare time swims, bikes and supports and plays football. From humble Southland beginnings, he's now developing his next level selfie game alongside his work at council. Stoked, and that is another understatement, to welcome using his official title, his worship, the mayor, Justin Lester. Thank you, David. That sounds very formal. Oh, we're, we're going to go right back to the informal, don't you worry. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. How <laughs> are you doing today? Great. It's a wonderful day. Oh, cool. Has it been a day in the office or a day out and about? A, a bit of both, um, which is the great thing about my role as well. No uh, two days are the same. Do you feel sometimes like your life is organised by other people, though? Mm, somewhat. Uh, every day is certainly planned, uh, down into 15 or 30 minute increments. So we had a, um, a period between, I think, 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. We had about six meetings and no time for lunch, which was awkward. Um, but it's busy. It's good fun. The one statistic I didn't check was how many employees has council got? Is it about 3,000? About 2,000. 2,000. So uh, how many names do you know? Uh, a good chunk. Good going. Any favourites? <laughs> uh, Joseph uh, is a good guy. He, um, he's a fast walker. Good skill to have in a in a walkable, livable city, right? Yeah. No, so we like walking around the city, and, and Joseph enjoys yeah coming along for the walk. Really, really interested to ask, is being mayor largely what you expected, or have you been surprised with a few things? Uh, it's largely what I expected. I had the benefit of being uh, a councillor for three years and deputy mayor for three years as well. I have been surprised at some aspects uh, and also at uh, the level of influence uh, that one can have has also exceeded my expectations, which has been good. In what way? Because that's something I was really interested in before the election. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, people often say, oh, can you actually make a, a change? And you can make an enormous change. Uh, you can determine the future of the city in the short term, medium term, long term uh, based on a series of decisions that you'll make. Uh, and if you've got the organisation, that 2,000 strong workforce, uh, working towards a, a focused narrative or a set of initiatives that, um, that you're very clear upon, um, then you can have a dramatic impact. And that's been great. It's a bit of a shame that you had to get rid of Paul Eagle for bad behaviour. I mean, like, just the some of the selfies were really ugly, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, look, he's, it's always been a lifelong ambition of his to go up to Parliament and a dream, and it's great to see him fulfil it. Yeah, totally. Um, I was just trying to count how many selfies you've got together and whether it's more than the number of selfies you have with your family or not, and I think it's about evens, to be honest. It's, uh, to be fair, I probably spent more time with Paul than I did with my family, which is um, slightly sad. Um, not for Paul. Yeah, no, Paul would have been great with it. Uh, Liz, p- perhaps quite happy, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> if from time to time when I go home now, I think she's uh, feels somewhat... Um, oh, she enjoys your autonomy, uh, perhaps. 
Paul having uh, flown the coop, uh, Jill Day as now your deputy mayor. How's she settling in? Yeah, she's doing a great job. Um, she's got the mana, the respect of other councillors. Um, she's new. Uh, she's only been on council herself for a little over a year. Um, but seamless transition, come straight into it and um, done a great job. I touched on the, the selfie game and I meant it in a quite light-hearted way, but I think it's got a really serious point to it, which is that you're kind of building engagement. Do you even enjoy doing so many selfies? Is, 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 is this you at the core or is this you presenting a facade? Um, no, oh, look, that's probably me at the core uh, in terms of, uh, I hope, I'm a fairly gregarious, open uh, person, get on well with people. Um, having said that, I mean, for a long time I didn't use Facebook. At the same time, there's a, a certain, I think for, for many Southlanders, a certain humility that you don't put your head above the parapet, you don't sort of shout about what you're doing. Uh, so that took some time for me to actually engage with. Um, having said that, um, it's good fun, you know, it's, and that's my personality. Maybe just diving into the first of our few topics, this whole idea of livable cities, what is it that you think makes such a livable city? Uh, firstly, the people. Um, Wellington's got quite a different feel to it than many other cities uh, around the country. Uh, quite different from Auckland, quite different again from Christchurch. Uh, it's, for a start, it's not clicky. Um, people have got an open mind, prepared to meet new people. Um, it is compact, it's easy to get around, and um, which is great. Um, look, the first time I came here, I remember thinking, I can't believe there are skyscrapers in Wellington. I'd never seen a building more than sort of five, six stories tall. Um, all these people in um, this quite dense space. Um, yeah, you feel alive walking down the street, that's great. But in terms of making a livable city, do you think skyscrapers are in Wellington's future in terms of density? That's the only option we've got. Um, We don't have the luxury of a lot of land that we can build upon, um, and so we're going to have to go up rather than out. And to be honest, that's what makes an an interesting city as well, I think. Um, uh, I've lived in plenty of places that are flat and spread out, and I don't enjoy them nearly as much as I do this one. And this is a city that is literally on the edge of the world you know we, we, we sit facing up Pacific Ocean one direction Cook Strait and the Tasman Sea in another um, we're, we've got a multitude of earthquake faults and tectonic plates that are rubbing one another directly beneath us um, we're not far off the furious 50s and the roaring 40s uh, and you know with climate change and sea level rise I mean that's an issue for us too so if you're, um, if you're scared of the future uh, you probably want to search uh, a place that um, is less interesting. Um, but that's what makes Wellington so much fun. How cool do you think Wellington is? Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty cool in an understated, quirky, irreverent Kiwi way. Um, I think it's funny. If you d- depict Wellington as a couple of individuals, it's probably Jermaine Clement and Brett McKenzie. Um, understated, quite funny, quite dry. Uh, and, yeah, just a bit different. I had a uh, audience question uh, from, I'm guessing, one of the organisers of the off-grid conference where you're speaking, I think, either next week or the week after. And the, the, they asked me to pose to you the, the thought about, well, maybe give away some of your presentation, um, what is it about experiential cities that is kind of like their USP? What, what is unique about them that is diff- either difficult to copy or is kind of like a signature for them? Well, what do you think Wellington has? Um, Wellington's got great design for a start. Um, you know, everywhere you go, there is a there is a point and a place. There's a certain heritage. Uh, there's an experience that you have uh, in this city, and you won't necessarily have in others. Um, and that's whether it's reflecting. It's a nod to the history of the city. It's a nod to the built form, the architecture, the heritage. Um, uh, there's you can see it's it, a lot of thought has gone into it, uh, and it's part of what I enjoy about the city. We then got into reconciling livable, experiential cities alongside the important issue of affordability. So we've got some definite challenges, and but those aren't unique to Wellington. They're unique to cities that are sophisticated, where people want to live um, and have a great quality of life. And I, I'd look at others like, be it Berlin, uh, be it um, a, a Melbourne, slightly different because it's not doesn't quite have the compact nature that we have. Or San Francisco is a, a very similar city um, uh, on the American continent. Um, you've got to remember, though, it's... Um, 
that's one of the advantages of Wellington also create these disadvantages but also don't view the city in isolation we've got an entire region um, and people are attracted to the compact nature of the CBD and that's where the vibrancy is um, but we also have you know, Porirua uh, Lower Heart and Upper Heart and the Kapiti Coast uh, we have the Wairapa where there's plenty of space for people to live in much more affordable accommodation as well uh, but we do want to make sure that people can actually live in our CBD too and that's why it's great we've got 2,400 social housing units uh, we're working on a scheme to develop more uh, affordable housing units and that'll be proactively invested in uh, by the council and even today I had a meeting with Housing New Zealand where we've got um, about 140, 150 new units coming on stream over the next 12 to 18 months as well so there's more to do, there's no doubt about that um, and I'm glad that now the narrative has changed from um, the market will respond or the market will provide to actually uh, central and local government need to provide, provide and respond uh, because it, um, there is there has been market fa- failure Touching on that housing thought um, you've worked with a council with your encouragement has worked with Vic Uni to introduce the voluntary uh, uh, rental WAF scheme just talk a little bit about what your hopes are perhaps for the future for that scheme uh, my hopes are that, is that every single Wellingtonian will live in a, a safe, dry, warm home. Um, I grew up in a state house uh, that was it was great because it was affordable, um, but it wasn't very good quality. Uh, it was an Invercargill, so it was tended to be, by its very nature, colder uh, than other parts of the country, and probably a bit damper as well. Uh, and while I was, in hindsight, um, extremely um, fortunate that we had that certainty and security of a, of a home that we could afford to live in um, I also want that people can live in a ha- house that's healthy uh, and kids shouldn't be sick they shouldn't be disadvantaged because of the climate they live in um, it's incongruous to me that we can live in New Zealand which is, has a, a fairly mild and temperate climate and you can go over to places like Canada or or Europe and uh, where they have you know, regular winter temperatures of minus 20 degrees and be much warmer however in their home and living conditions um, and it comes down to good regulation uh, and it comes down to a willingness to actually say this isn't good enough uh, we deserve better um, and families deserve better Regulation tends to cost though does it not? No, I, not necessarily I wouldn't agree on that because there's a whole of system consideration uh, housing is not necessarily more expensive in Europe or Canada uh, just because um, they have better quality uh, developments uh, they also have greater land supply uh, and uh, a probably more efficient housing market and housing construction market uh, with greater competition and hence is actually cheaper over there. Um, other things, you know, we don't have a capital gains tax in New Zealand. Um, uh, there isn't a strong equities market. People tend to invest or, uh, or have their, their retirement uh, income in housing. Uh, and as a result, uh, up until recently, anybody from overseas could um, buy a house in New Zealand and own it uh, and didn't have to build their own. Um, so as a result, you, have, you had limited supply in the market and everybody competing and pushing prices up. Uh, so those are some of the reasons um, that we've also had expensive housing. Uh, and it's it's not simply just, come, just coming down to the construction costs. And that actual fact, the land costs is, uh, uh, are much greater or has a much greater effect on, on the affordability of the house. You ever want to build your own house? Uh, maybe, yes. Um, I, I would love to. Having said that, I've just watched my um, my in-laws go through that process and it's extremely taxing as well. Uh, so maybe when the kids have moved on uh, in a quieter time, but certainly not right now. Is that build your own as in, you know, do it with your own hands or is that stand around pointing at things? Uh, no, a combination. I mean, um, I am useless. I've got office boy hands um, and have no handy person skills whatsoever. Um, but I, I know I could learn, uh, and that's just simply being on site and learning with somebody. So um, I could learn uh, and would like to. Uh, don't have the time right now. Two law degrees, no less. So there's, there's a reasonably significant amount of proof that you can learn pretty fast. Yeah, well, I think anyone can learn if they put their mind to it. Um, and I haven't been, <laughs> unfortunately, haven't really had the experience of, um, of learning on a construction site. And um, I, like, I like getting involved in things and wish I could. Um, but up until this point in time, haven't had the chance. Do you mind me asking, uh, just thinking about education very briefly, why you um, chose to study a BA in German? Uh, A couple of reasons. Um, I'm also a bit of a... uh, I find loopholes and shortcuts in life. Uh, And I was... I'd lived in Germany for a year and was reasonable at it. 
and uh, I thought, oh, this will be an easy way to get good grades uh, and get a quick degree. Uh, and also, I didn't really know anything about the educational university system. I was first in family to go to university. Parents hadn't been there, uh, nor had my siblings. And um, I didn't know that you could go to university and study law. I thought law school was a separate entity. Uh, so uh, I was a bit confused. Too much American television. Yeah, I, th- yeah, I think so. That's mm-hmm. the only th- my only experience of uh, of um, of law school was on TV. Yeah, that's why so many people. Uh, stand up and think you can walk up to the um, judge's bench and things like that because that's what they say on American television. You just you just can't do that in New Zealand. Joseph's not a lawyer as well, is he? He's a journalist, a very good journalist. He's written 50-odd books, yeah. actually. He'd be the, um, I'd, I'd say he'd be the, the preeminent sporting journalist, uh, sorry, author in New Zealand. Would you say that to a Joseph? I, would, I wouldn't say it, but I'm happy that Justin's saying it. <laughs> good work. Would you call him your left or your right hand man, or just somebody who hangs around a lot? <laughs> oh, just a guy that works in the office. I <laughs> know <laughs> oh, it was really great that after the serious accident you're involved in last year, that you're both okay. I'm just really stoked that you know that, that, that came out good. Could have yeah, been much worse. So were we. Joseph bore most of the brunt, to be fair. Uh, uh, so no, we're very. Uh, actually, to be quite honest about, it, I think we both thought we were going to die. Uh, so we're very glad that we didn't. Hey, I've just got a couple of audience questions on housing before we rock into a couple of other things. Any thoughts on higher energy efficiency standards? Example, Passive House for council projects? Um, for council projects, um, well, if we're building, yeah, anything we can do to get more energy efficient um, units, yes, of course we would. It just comes as a cost a consideration uh, in terms of what we're providing and uh, we've got to be conscious of, of Wellington ratepayers' um, resources as well. I'm also not sure uh, how passive, much passive building you can do in a city when you're not kind of able to look out over a, an area because passive, passive building or the passive heating involves a bit of, you know, you need quite a lot of skyline and the right angles and things like that. And once you're in a city, you start losing those pretty quickly. Is, yeah, is that you, fair? You need sun. You need solar gain. Uh, so, that, yeah, there, there are always challenges. But, um, having said that, I mean, if I was to build a house, it's the type of house I'd like to build. Your point cuts really to the heart, I think, of one of the overarching thoughts in this discussion, which is to do with you're treading a very fine line between, uh, you, you've previously been quoted about um, this crowdfunding and it's called tax and rates, um, which I think is a really neat way to look at a redistributive model for providing like society with the resources it needs and the infrastructure. Um, but you kind of go too high, you're not going to be in office in three years, two years time almost. You can't please people either way, basically. So well, one of the things I'm really interested, even before we dive into other topics, though, is that sense of how do you manage to get stuff done when there's those two opposing forces at like, almost at every corner? Uh, you try and squeeze what you can out of a budget. That's the first uh, thing you need to do. Um, look, we've, we're embarking on a decade of culture, and we've been talking about that for um, the last sort of six or 12 months now. Uh, which will mean um, another couple of million dollars invested into the arts and events in the city. Um, uh, but I've had to take most of the money from other sources um, and from uh, funds that were pre-existing, so not raising new rates monies for this, um, uh, but reappropriating money that otherwise would have gone or been spent elsewhere. Congratulations. You're around halfway into the first of two episodes chatting with Mayor Justin Lester about what makes Wellington one of the greatest little cities on earth. My goal for this show is to be capturing and sharing stories firsthand from the people striving to make positive dents on a fast-changing society and to reveal some of their why. I've got to tell you, I love sitting down with changemakers to explore some of their motivations to contributing to the greater good through innovation, creativity and enterprise. Returning to the conversation with Justin and Victoria, we chatted about the importance of culture to Wellington. I hear from little New Zealand fringe birdie, you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, she claims that you're going to attend every New Zealand fringe event this year. Is this true or not? <laughs> It'd be highly ambitious. Um, I could uh, lie through my teeth and say yes, but uh, unfortunately I, I won't be. I'll try to get to, uh, along to as much as I can. In fact, we had someone from Fringe up in the office today uh, who had opening night last night, uh, auntie, and uh, did, did a little skit with us in the office, and it was good fun. Um, yeah, unfortunately most of my evenings are already planned about four to six weeks in advance. It makes it hard. Uh, to get along to everything you want to. I think it's actually technically impossible to get to every fringe show, 
particularly in a year with a festival on. Yeah, that's, um, um, there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's great. I've got a friend trying to come over from uh, Turkey at the moment and he can't find a hotel for love or money. Why is culture important to a city? And secondly, why is it worth selectively investing more in culture and potentially less in something like housing? Uh, well, you need a balance first. I mean, uh, and that's the difficult question. People say, oh, are you spending money on this? Why not on this? Well, we can spend money on both. And it's a question of how much on each and how um, you prioritise. Uh, why is culture important? Because it tells our stories. It tells us what we are as a city and, and who we are as a people. Uh, and that's what makes cities different as well. If you don't spend any money on culture, it's, to be honest, quite a boring place to live. Um, and look, we love the fact there's lots to do and lots to attend. And we talked before about an experiential city. Um, uh, look, Wellington has, over recent decades, begun to tell its story well. And Joseph and I were talking this morning about how dull Wellington was as a city in the 1980s. I said, why is it dull? Uh, uh, and yeah, it was dull because not much happened outside of people turning up and going to public service work and then going home and living in suburbia. It's hard to imagine that you remember the 80s. Oh, barely. Um, I was, oh, my first memory of as a child of Wellington was actually the sesquicentenary. Um, it's Sesqui 1990, the land of the long white cloud. And um, I, I thought that was great. The advertising campaign, by all accounts, was a huge failure. It was rotten. Uh, I remember it very well. I'm glad it didn't come. Yeah. I've got, we've got a flag that we've acquired from somewhere of this, the big white a big white flag with the red uh, sesqui circle and it's a heron or a something else bird in it. And yeah, it's it was a heron a, cortica, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a yeah, massive flop and an outrageous sort of event at the time. How do you try and reach consensus to be ple- pleasing as many people as much of the time as possible while still occasionally making the hard calls? Uh, it helps that you have a budget that extends into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so that gives you scope to do a lot. Uh, look, when we first came into our long-term plan, or 10-year plan process, um, we were steering down the barrel of a 7.1% uh, rates increase. And that's not really sustainable. Uh, and... Look, and look, I own a business too, and I want to make sure that people can afford their rates. And if you compound that over a number of years, um, it's just getting too expensive. Uh, so we talk. Um, I mean, ninety percent of the ideas that come through in our ten-year plan aren't from me. Uh, they're from talking to people around the city. Uh, and uh, what's a good idea? This is your specific area of interest. Um, and then filtering the, the best ideas um, and finding those diamonds. Um, and there, are, unfortunately, there's some really good ones that we just can't afford to do um, but you take the best ones what does culture mean to you uh, culture means to me well it's an expression of who we are uh, and and that for every different individual will be slightly different um, but it's around telling stories it's around expressing uh, oneself and for through a variety of different forms of media and whether it be through dance or, or song or performance um, but it is that expression of ideals, uh, ideas, and stories. Favourite genres or styles of culture, absorption, and... Uh, personally, oh, I love theatre, no, but I probably enjoy music um, uh, just as much as some of my best uh, moments. We were talking before about you know, Scorch and Bay and enjoying that. San Francisco Bathhouse is probably one of my favourite places to attend in the city because... Uh, uh, every time I'm there at a concert, um, it lingers in the memory for many years to come. Um, so that's a good way to, to hang out with friends, have a good time, and, uh, and enjoy the moment. Is, um, you just reminded me, is Paul Eagle a bit of a DJ? A DJ? Uh, I've <laughs> I think no. <laughs> this is a light-hearted reference to um, PM Jacinda being a bit of a DJ, Chloe Swarbrick being a bit of a DJ. It's kind of like, seems as you want to you want to get ahead in uh, New Zealand politics these days. You've got to be a DJ. So if you're young, you should be a DJ. Um, well, I know where they can learn. <laughs> to Oaha, uh, totally, to my oh. brand new building. Learn DJing. Yeah, yeah, we've well, got a whole pop, DJing room. Oh, well, I have to it's pop in and have a go. Yeah, yeah, okay, done. Normally, it's just me flicking through the um, what do we call it? I was going to say iPod. People don't have iPods anymore. Do they? through Spotify. I'd like to say you're showing your age, yeah, but yeah, I've oh, got I've plenty of years on you. <laughs> Um, can I ask? I just want to um, come back to that culture question because I'm interested in because uh, I agree with you completely, as you I'm sure you know, around culture and creativity and the importance of it as storytelling and reflecting back. I'm thinking also about participation because it's one thing to sit in an audience and enjoy something, or you know, stand in a crowded bar and jump up and down, which I'm sure is part of your um, collective memory. But 
the other part of it is the um, the enjoy the the engagement and doing it yourself. Is that part of uh, council plans or part of your uh, approach to this? Uh, so we want to enable people to do whatever they want, whatever their dream is. We want to help them or allow them to do it. And a variety of means we can do that through making the arts more accessible. Through, for example, if we're talking about um, um, a painted or art form um, and that's making it um, publicly available through the galleries or our funding that we provide or if it's about putting it on the external facades of buildings to inspire people to to seek a different course um, in terms of accessibility I and mean, that's part of the reason I'm doing this I'm one of my lasting regrets and hope something I hope to change in the future is I don't play a musical instrument uh, and I wish I could uh, and certainly encouraging my kids to do it uh, and simply because we couldn't afford it as children uh, and my singing's horrible um, and you know, I've done plenty of debating and, and acting in the past uh, as a young person um, but I want to anybody who wants that dream you've got to give them a job last yeah. time I saw you debate was involved singing Justin uh, of Frozen if I remember correctly oh yes that was fun that was um, <laughs> nowhere to run nowhere to hide changing the words to Frozen I can't even remember what the moot was that was um, that was I, I did oh, a, something about a piece arts on and Colin po- Craig something about arts and politics or something or culture and politics uh, I can't remember what the, the heard, moot was I think I probably amended the moot to suit my interest I um, can imagine uh, and lack of singing abilities uh, <laughs> and changed the words to Frozen uh, I think it was Colin Craig coming out of the closet actually that song yeah Sorry, I just had a flashback from sitting at the back of Bats Out of Sight and but remembering Justin singing. We do get uh, from people is look, um, for an order for someone to sustain their enthusiasm uh, or their career in the arts, is you've got to give them a job. You've got to be able to pay them to do it, uh, and and we can do that in certain ways. And, um, and but ultimately, for many institutions, more funding helps. I then asked Justin another audience question about how council hopes to support keeping large and small venues open. Uh, one thing we want to do this year is so we've gone through a, a venues review and said look we've got to make them more affordable particularly for, for local organisations and so we'll be doing that uh, and that's through providing subsidies you want to make sure you distinguish between commercial ventures and either not for profit or, um, or non-commercial ventures uh, and supporting local entities as well What's the latest on the town hall? Uh, it'll be finished in 2021 it'll be great uh, It'll be wonderful. Um, the irony, of course, is, is I was just reading a document yesterday, which was um, when they relaunched in 1992 the town hall after its refurbishment and earthquake strengthening. I just wish they'd done the strengthening properly. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, we're back there and spending $90 million doing it again 20-odd uh, years later. Um, so we'll be done in 2021. Uh, Symphony Orchestra will have it as its permanent home, uh, as will the Tukorki School of Music, and it'll be wonderful. Is that, is that locked down too, the School of Music? Yes, yes. Oh, great. For the town hall, absolutely. It's next uh, door. Yeah, next door is the question. Uh, and they ideally want to be based closely. It's just a question of um, uh, the best building and the earthquake strengthening of it. Like your fireworks, do you? Uh, fireworks, yeah. Um, uh, for kids, perhaps. Uh, and I enjoy a good fireworks. Uh, Chinese New Year, we've got fireworks this weekend. It'll be great. That's uh, good fun. Um, I'm not one that's going to necessarily travel all the way into the city just to watch it for myself but I'd take the kids I think moving the fireworks to Matariki was a genius move thank you, uh, not agreed by everybody um, and it's funny it's um, certainly had various and conflicting advice uh, from uh, people within my office and people I talked to and said oh politically it's a, it's a foolish decision, I said I don't care because uh, <laughs> it's the right decision it is totally um, the right decision, and for because, a whole bunch of reasons well, a, a Guy Fawkes is just a waste of time, there's no relevance to New Zealand that I can detect and um, well, celebrating a terrorist act Yeah, and so if that's going to get thousands of people down to Matariki um, then uh, Matariki is more important for me than the fireworks itself, it's not about fireworks, it's about the celebration of Fano and uh, food and family, fire as well. Um, but that'll help. And winter, which is a much more appropriate time. Well, not quite winter, but almost. Yeah, it'd yeah. be good. I hope we get some decent weather too. Like darkness, for example. Well, that exactly. Would, that would really that was help. A, that's one of the mm. other things about Guy Fawkes is that you're waiting till nine o'clock, and by that time, meh. Kia it's David here, rounding out the first of two episodes, chatting livable cities, culture, and some of the things that make Wellington Mayor Justin Lester tick in the podcave here at BizDojo Cowork Wellington. 
After this short outro, you'll discover us quaffing and rating fine New Zealand craft beer and continuing the conversation at a different tempo. The second episode publishes next week and delves a little more into his personal impact journeys to now, alongside transit and infrastructure talk and tech as a driver of current and future prosperity. The next guest in your ears is Christine Langdon, CEO at The Good Registry. She chats with Rebecca Stewart about the recently launched social enterprise which magically simplifies gift giving to help good causes and reduce waste. I want to shout out the two organisations supporting me to deliver this show. BizDojo are creating and facilitating communities of talented, interesting and clever humans pursuing their passions through a burgeoning network of co-work spaces across New Zealand. Their goal is to facilitate communities of people to collaborate in an inclusive, friendly and respectful environment with flexible options for small and large teams and contract-free plans to suit any business. Go develop and deliver your purpose over at bizdojo.com. I'm also grateful to Collider Wellington, which deliver a lively and diverse monthly program of largely free events. Access world-class intelligence, hang with some of the smartest people on earth and learn something new. Their goal is to help you connect with thought leaders, emerging entrepreneurs and inspirational experts to support the growth of the greatest little city on earth, Wellington, New Zealand. For all the details, go to colliderwellington.com. That is spelt colliderwgtn.com. You can find show notes and links in your podcast app of choice and via twicepodcast.com where you'll also find today's episode match from the archives. Number 48, featuring Culture at the Sharp End, with Joe Randerson and Heather O'Carroll talking life in the experience economy. Connect with the show on Twitter and Instagram at Twice Podcast. Justin Lester, just about anywhere. Victoria Spackman on Twitter at Victorian Purple. And me on Twitter at David underscore Binstead. Are you ready for a beer? Oh, yeah. It's very pretty. Now, this is uh, Garage Project's Golden Age, which is a, um, a blended sour, in fact. First uh, beverage of the day, gentlemen? Uh, first alcoholic one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, it's safe to say. Um, on the record. Yeah. Anything off the record that I definitely won't put in the edit? <laughs> no, no. First drink of the day. Cure It's really sour and therefore high on the scorecard already. Justin? Yeah, I love it. It's refreshing. Um, I'd probably be more inclined to drink this over the summer rather than the winter. Um, yeah, good level of acidity um, and very easy on the palate. Very low bubbles, which I'm always in favour of. Uh, and the bottles. Are my, and I, I didn't realise, you did tell me the name, but it didn't, I don't think I connected it. It's 27 Names, which is a clothing line. Absolutely. It's yeah. a collab between Garage Project and them. Yeah, that's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Joseph, if you uh, imposter into the conversation as far as podcasting is concerned, just uh, a quick uh, comment. Yeah, uh, got a sound which I like and also it's very cold, which is really good. You got any favourites that you kind of in- enjoy quaffing of an, a special occasion or so, Justin? Yeah, and I'll always try and go local. Um, so Garage Project, uh, Parrot Dog, um, not Wellington local, but a, a beer that I've, I've s- sampled lately, which I really enjoyed, Boneface out in Upper Hutt. Um, yeah, but uh, I'd always probably go Garage Project or Parrot Dog. Easy wins. Yeah, and good beer. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Victoria? I will try almost anything once. I'm an ABC, so anything but Chardonnay. I like food and drink that is interesting and challenging and not just, you know, the same as last time. So, um, you know, try something new and interesting. Uh, nicely snuck in the tagline there, try something new. So how do you think Garage Projects have done with the Golden Age? Is that a tagline? Yeah, that is, their, that is actually their hashtag tagline, yeah. That's how I live my life. I didn't realise I was living my life the Garage Project way. <laughs> Maybe they copy it. Hang on, I was here first. Yeah, of course you were. Of course you were. I'll, I'll have words with them. Yeah, could you? So, uh, you started out with a like, a little bit more detail, and maybe a, uh, a summary in school. I like it a lot. I like the sour. I always like sour anything. Lemon juice is my favourite condiment with everything. Um, this is great. I'll drink this a lot. It doesn't taste alcoholic, which is slightly troublesome. I would, um, yeah, I would buy this again today and tomorrow and the day after. 
score out of 10? 46? 46 out of 10? Yeah. That's pretty good going. <laughs> From half a glass down. Uh, Justin, I uh, spent quite a bit of time in Germany, talk about later, but uh, how does this compare with the, uh, the beer halls and... Uh, beer available on tap there? Yeah, quite different uh, because they're very traditional with their beers, uh, tend to focus on their lagers, their pilsners, I mean, although they've adopted that from uh, the Czech Republic. Um, I've, yeah, drank many a lager in Germany and, and it's very good beer and they operate by the, the notion of the, the Reinheitsgebot as well, which are only three ingredients um, and you can't put anything else in, which I quite like, you know, it's pure, you know, it's as organic as it's going to be um, but I love the sour beer it's, you know I'd give it a, a, a decent four and a half 4.8 out of five um, um, yeah it's, I, again I'd prefer to drink it over the summer I think um, refreshing um, quite happily in the middle of the afternoon probably not too late in the evening um, but it's very good how do you think it'd go down at council oh, I think they'd give it a nudge uh, <laughs> Uh, depends. They're, they're pretty into sour, aren't they? Yeah, some of them. <laughs> no, they're they're a good group. Um, they probably enjoy their wines more than their beers, um, but they they try it. This has wine like qualities, though. It, yeah, it does. You're right. Uh, whether they're into the sour or more traditional, we've got a couple of um, councillors that don't drink at all, um, which is good. And I take my hat off to them. But no, I enjoy a good, decent quality beer. So. In your time in Germany, did you ever soak in beer? Not soaked in beer. That would be interesting. And in, in fact, <laughs> something I should probably put on my bucket list. You should. I've done it. It's awesome. Really? Yeah. Awesome, good fun? Yeah, in Pilsen. Or in just Pilsen. Outside, yeah, I've been just to outside Pilsen. of Pilsen. I had a school camp in Pilsen with my German group. That was fun. Um, yeah, that was a highlight. We won't, we won't delve down into the depths of that memory. What, what goes on tour stays yeah, on tour, yeah. right? Um, with a, a, a group of German 17, 18 year old school kids um, what, what could go wrong? Well, nothing went wrong, it was great, it was fantastic um, but Yeah, the fact you're, I think you're allowed to imbibe in Germany and Europe from 16 as well and bust a load of kids so it's great fun Joseph, if you had to give uh, this fine brew a, uh, a final score or judgment or thought how would you, how would you roll? Four, four and a half out of five, I think it's great and I agree with Justin, actually I, I wouldn't drink this too late in the evening it's an early evening drink. Always good to agree with your boss, right? I don't often, but I am on this one. This is the first time. Can I actually, <laughs> on that point, can I um, perhaps reflect upon one of the reasons, one of the compelling reasons for, for employing Joseph was that uh, he was the person probably most critical of the council in the entire city. And I thought, well, how do we take him out to give him a job? Yes, it's funny on the other side. They're, they're doing a much better job than I thought when you look at it from the other side. <laughs> Oh, you're going to definitely get on the Christmas card list of that one. Captured, captured. Yeah, beautiful. My goal for this show is supporting purpose-led people movements through talks with innovators, creatives and enterprises making positive dents on society, which neatly is the acronym for the show title, TWICE. Come for the innovation, creativity and enterprise and stay for the journeys to now and craft beer tasting and rating in long-form episodes. Thank you for lending us your ears. It means a lot. I hope the conversations offer inspiration and encouragement for making your own social impact in whatever shape or form. This is one of more than 70 tightly edited conversations published since September 2015, focused on capturing and sharing the positive dents people are striving to make on society. Show family and friends how they can access this and many other shows on their digital devices by sharing the free gift of podcasting. Start them on the digital radio journeys by setting them up with this show via one of many locations, including Spotify, and they'll think you're a magician and a guru. Links to all the listening location options are right in the show notes, accessible via your podcast app of choice and over at twicepodcast.com. <laughs>